Alright, in this video we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are the forces that act between molecules, so this is very important. We've been talking about bonding so far, which is the forces that are within molecules. So if we have a, let's say, a CH4 molecule, we have the carbon with the four hydrogens, and we have bonds in between each of these. But what we're talking about with intermolecular forces is the forces between molecules. So if we have a CH4 molecule and let's say another CH4 molecule, we're talking about not the bonds within each of these molecules, but what type of forces do we have acting in here between these two molecules? So these intermolecular forces, they can help us predict the properties of a substance, such as the boiling point and the melting point. So if we have, let's say, a substance that has really strong intermolecular forces, let's suppose that, that these two molecules here had really strong intermolecular forces. They actually don't, but we'll get to that. But let's just suppose that they did. In that case, would the boiling point be high or low? If you want to pause the video and think about this question for a sec, what would happen to the boiling point as the forces between molecules increased? So if you want to pause the video, go ahead, think about this, and uh, we'll talk about it now. So uh, the, the forces between these molecules being really strong would make it harder for these molecules to boil. So if we think about what happens in terms of uh, molecular interactions, if we have a liquid, let's say a liquid might look something like this, right? The molecules are pretty close together. They're not rigidly arranged, but they're, they're pretty, pretty close together. And then if we want to boil, that means we're going from liquid to gas, where we have all these molecules all spread apart, all flying all over the place, right? So this is the difference between liquid and gas. Liquid, these molecules are held together a lot more tightly than they are in the gas phase. And a solid would be, obviously, this rigid structure would be even more tightly held together. These intermolecular forces between these molecules would be even stronger than the liquid. So the weakest intermolecular forces would be in a gas, and the strongest would be in the solid phase. If we're just comparing one, sing one single substance from solid to liquid to gas, the strongest strongest intermolecular forces are going to be in the solid phase because that's where it's, it's really held together a lot more rigidly and, and tightly. So if we have a substance that has really strong intermolecular forces, these are being held together really tightly. If we're trying to boil, which is to go from liquid to gas, these, these, we have to break these interactions because we want to kind of free up these molecules to go off and, and fly around in the gas phase. So if these are held together really tightly, it's going to be really hard to do that. So we're going to have to heat it up really hot to, to break these forces and allow this substance to boil. So uh, the boiling point, the temperature, would be higher because that is, uh, we're, we're going to have to add more heat to the substance in order to get it from the liquid to phase, the, to, from the liquid phase to the gas phase. The melting point would be the same exact concept. We're trying to go from solid to liquid. We have to break these forces between the solid molecules and loosen them up a little bit to get into the liquid phase. But either way, we have to take the, the forces between these two molecules, like we're looking at here, and break those and, and free them up in the liquid phase. So if these are really strong forces, it's going to take a lot of energy to break those and free it up into the liquid phase. So the melting point would then be higher. It's going to take more heat added in order to break those forces. So the stronger the forces, the higher the boiling point and the higher the melting point. That's a really important concept to understand. So the first type of forces that we're going to talk about are dipole-dipole forces. So these occur between polar molecules. So those molecules that we were looking at before, remember your polarity video using snap, we can decide the polarity. but the CH4 molecules that we just looked at, those are nonpolar because they are symmetrical, symmetrical nonpolar. So dipole-dipole forces are going to happen between polar molecules. So we could take a molecule like HCl, and this is going to be a very polar molecule, right? We have a big negative end over here and a positive end over here because all the electrons are being held towards the chlorine side. So if we take a molecule like this, and then we take another molecule like this, another HCl, which is also going to be very polar, we've got this negative end and this positive end, we're going to have a pretty strong interaction between these two molecules because we've got a positive end here and a negative end here, and these are going to be really attracted to each other. Positives and negatives attract, opposite charges attract. So we have a positive end of this HCl attracting the negative end of this HCl, of this other HCl, 
And so that's going to give us a pretty strong attraction. And that's what dipole-dipole forces are, are, are forces between polar molecules. So we've got the negative end of one attracting the positive end of the other because, again, opposite charges attract. So the more polar the molecule, the stronger the force is going to be. And this is very important. If we take another molecule that's less polar, uh, let's say maybe HBr, it's going to have the same structure here. We're going to have the same uh, type of interactions. So a polar molecule is going to lead to dipole-dipole forces. We've got a positive and a negative end, a positive and a negative end. We're still going to have attraction between this positive end here and this negative end here. But the difference is, if we look at the electronegativity values, this HBr is going to be less polar. There's going to be less of a difference in electronegativity between H and Br than there is between H and Cl. So this is going to be more polar and this is going to be less polar. So what, that's, what that is going to mean is that the more polar molecule has the stronger forces. So we can say that HCl is going to have the stronger forces, the intermolecular forces, because it is more polar. The HBr being less polar is going to have slightly weaker intermolecular forces than the HCl. So again, the more polar the molecule, the stronger the forces, the intermolecular forces are going to be. All right, so if we think about this in terms of this, uh, this little scenario we got here, we have NH3 boiling at negative 33 degrees Celsius. That, that's its boiling point. And pH3 boils at negative 88 degrees Celsius. So which molecule has the stronger dipole-dipole forces, and therefore which one would be more polar? So right off the bat, we said that boiling point is directly tied to these intermolecular forces. So the higher the boiling point, as we increase the, the boiling point, that means that the intermolecular forces have to be higher, have to be stronger. So if we have these two, we can tell right off the bat which one has the stronger intermolecular forces. We look at NH3, it boils at negative 33 degrees Celsius, which is higher than negative 88 degrees Celsius. So right off the bat, we know that which has the stronger forces, that would be NH3, because it has the higher boiling point. So things with a higher boiling point have to have higher or stronger intermolecular forces. So then which molecule would be more polar? Well, we said that the more polar a molecule is, the stronger its intermolecular forces are going to be. So we have a, a higher temperature for the NH3, which we said is going to mean that it has the stronger forces. So that must mean that it is also more polar. So NH3, because it has this higher boiling point, has the stronger intermolecular forces because it's going to take more energy to break those forces in between uh, the liquid to go to the gas phase. So then uh, which molecule would be more polar? Also NH3, because the more polar a molecule is, the stronger the intermolecular forces are going to be. All right, so this is a very typical question that you could see on the Regents. Uh, so you want to be able to understand the relationships between these intermolecular forces and some of the, the features uh, or the physical properties of a substance such as boiling and melting point. All right, so the next type of uh, force that we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonding. So this is a type of dipole-dipole force. It's a special case of dipole-dipole force that is very strong. So if there's one thing you know about hydrogen bonding, you need to know that it's very strong. So it occurs when H is bonded to N, O, or F. And th this should really say H is directly bonded to N, O, or F. So if we have a substance, let's say uh, C, O, H, and another H, this is not hydrogen bonding because the H here is not directly bonded to this O, and neither is this, right? We, we, these, are, these are bonded to the carbon. They're not directly bonded to the oxygen. So a substance that would have hydrogen bonding and that you need to know has hydrogen bonding is water. So water, a structure like this, right, we have H directly bonded to this oxygen here. So if it's directly bonded as opposed to here where we have H, which is part of a compound with oxygen, but it's not directly bonded to this oxygen. It's bonded to the carbon, which is then bonded to the oxygen. Whereas here we have direct bonding between the hydrogen and the oxygen. This is going to be hydrogen bonding. Yes, hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding if we have H directly bonded to an N, O, or F. So if we think about that previous example of NH3, NH3 is also going to have hydrogen bonding because it's H directly bonded to an N here, all three of these H's. So the reason that hydrogen bonding is so strong is because these, these three molecules here, or these three uh, atoms, create a really polar bond, a really polar molecule with hydrogen. If we think about water, we've got 
really big negative up here with the lone pairs and then these bonds are going to be polar as well because oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen these two electrons that are in this bond being shared between hydrogen and oxygen are going to be pulled more towards the oxygen end than they are the hydrogen end so we're going to have a whole bunch of negative charge up here and that's going to make a real negative end of this molecule leaving a real positive end down here by the hydrogens so if we take another water molecule that comes in here, it's going to really be attracted to this negative end with its positive end. So we could take H, H, and O. And now we have a second water molecule with its positive end that really wants to come in here and be attracted to this negative end. So we said the more polar a molecule is, the stronger the forces are going to be. So hydrogen bonding is a special case where we have really, really polar molecules that are going to have really, really strong forces because of that. So because water is so polar here, it's going to attract really well to another water molecule with its negative end attracting the positive end of the second molecule. So we said that because this is a big electronegativity difference here, in other words, this is a very polar bond as a part of a very polar molecule. And the other reason that hydrogen bonding is so strong is that hydrogen only has one electron. So here we have some like lone pairs up here with this oxygen. This hydrogen only has one electron. It contributes its electron to this bond and that's it. So once these electrons get pulled away from it towards the oxygen, hydrogen has nothing left here. It's, it's just empty over here. So this is going to leave a real positive charge because all that's there is the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, which is going to be positively charged, obviously, that's just the nucleus. So this is going to make for a, a really polar molecule, and again, because it's really polar, that's going to give us a really strong intermolecular force, and that's what makes hydrogen bonding so strong. All right, so the final type of intermolecular force that we're going to talk about here is London dispersion forces. So these occur between nonpolar molecules. So if we take that example of CH4, that's a nonpolar molecule. So this and another CH4 would have London forces between them. So these are very weak forces. If there's one thing you know about London forces is that they are very weak. So if we take these two molecules, there's no positive and negative end to them because they're symmetrical, they're nonpolar. So if we take them and put them next to each other, we don't have any sort of like positive and negative interaction there, right? It's just a couple of nonpolar molecules together. So what's going to happen? How do we have any forces of attraction between these? Well, it's from these temporary dipoles. So this is why London dispersion forces are so weak. It's because they come from temporarily induced dipoles. So what's going to happen is if we have, let's say, two nonpolar molecules that we're representing with two circles here, they have charge in them. There, there's a bunch of charge in this uh, carbon and hydrogen and hydrogen and hydrogen, right? There's, there's electrons being shared in this bond. So if, let's say, that in a molecule the electrons become unevenly distributed at some point, because we know that electrons move around randomly, right? So let's say that it just so happens that the electrons end up on the left side of this molecule at one point. What that's going to cause is this molecule to be uh, or th this, this molecule would then have kind of a positive end over here. So we have a negative end of this molecule because all the electrons moved over here, and then we have a positive end because all the electrons left this side. So if we have another molecule that comes in here, this positive charge over here is going to kind of attract all the negative charge to be pulled towards this end of this molecule. So then that's going to create a positive end of this molecule because the electrons have left and kind of moved over to the left here. So this is a very temporary situation because as soon as this charge redistributes evenly, there's no longer attraction between this, uh, the electrical charges on this, uh, on this molecule. So this is a very weak attraction because it's just temporary. We can, as soon as the charges move back, they're going to be done being attracted to each other in terms of electrical uh, attraction. So that, that's why London forces are very weak because these are kind of just uh, very, very temporary, very fleeting uh, uh, forces that attract here. So the other thing to know about London forces is that the larger the molecule, the stronger the London forces. So if we have a big molecule, and even if it's nonpolar, we can have a lot bigger chance for us, or, or a lot a chance for a lot bigger charge uh, distribution here. So we have uh, a bunch of negative charge over here and a bunch of positive charge. Because it's a big molecule, we've got a lot of charge available to possibly redistribute. Whereas if we compare that to a small molecule that only has maybe a, a couple of electrons, we can only have a little bit of charge in here become redistributed. It's not going to be as big, an effect, as big of an effect as it will be for the larger molecule. So we have a whole bunch of charge being able to be 
uh, unevenly distributed here in the larger molecule, whereas in the small molecule, it's only a little bit of charge. That's not going to create very strong attractions at all. So these are all weak attractions, but the smaller molecules are weakest, and the larger molecules are weak, but still stronger than the London forces of those smaller molecules. All right, so London dispersion forces, you got to know they're very weak. Uh, you should kind of be able to explain that they come from these temporary dipoles, and that's why they're very weak. And then also know, very importantly, that the larger the molecule, the stronger the London forces are going to be. So if you compare two molecules, whichever one is larger is generally going to have the stronger London dispersion forces. All right, I hope you learned a lot about intermolecular forces in this video, and I'll see you in the next one.